So when we're thinking about uh, our 25.ai, uh, we're thinking about actually two whys, so two, two main motivators. Uh, so one of them is that uh, we don't like uh, mind controlling companies uh, controlling our minds. Uh, but I, I will get to that in, in a second. Uh, like for me, the primary motivator um, is how to spend every second uh, I have right. Uh, that can mean different things to different people. Uh, okay, so I'm working, I like working. I'm an entrepreneur for the last decade. Um, and my life mission is to make uh, impact. Okay, others want uh, to finish their day at 5 p.m. and do something else, and both options are perfectly fine, perfectly good. The point is that we want to spend our time in the most effective way possible. Uh, and looking at things that can help our ability to fulfill our goals, uh, attention uh, specifically for, for gens uh, Y and Z uh, is probably the biggest one. Uh, like in this day and age, especially working from home, uh, in growing digital environments, uh, we see this as a leading call uh, for people not achieving what, what they came to achieve. Uh, and we've all been there. Like we open our phone for just a second, uh, spending there 45 minutes. Uh, we're starting to work on a Word document. We get tired. We go somewhere else and we get sucked uh, into that. Uh, and that's not a mistake. That's not a mistake. That's by design. Um, like we have other companies that are using our data um, and controlling our minds uh, to capture our attention. Um, and we see ourselves as the antidote. Uh, to those mind controlling uh, companies. Uh, so I, I really want to, to keep it brief. Uh, so I, I will just share a couple of examples uh, of how uh, of how we're the antidote uh, of uh, of this uh, uh, of this problem. So let's say that uh, that you're working on a word document uh, and we know that um, and by analyzing your data that it usually takes you uh, 20 minutes until you, uh, you lose attention. So we'll raise your awareness to that. Um, and your awareness is the most important thing. Um, like other than Michael, uh, we have, a, um, in addition to Michael, we have a super impressive uh, scientific board. Um, and uh, from Stanford and MIT and like very impressive uh, schools, universities. Uh, so in this case, we'll give you a timer, okay? The intervention is simple. We'll just raise your awareness to how much, uh, to how you're doing. And another example, that's an example that, that we based on my wife. So my wife has constantly has 100 open tabs and it is driving me crazy. And it's proven that it is um, affecting uh, our um, ability to, to focus, to, to, to control our attention. So we'll help her by, by closing five. Um, and we can, uh, we can do many, many other things. We can uh, follow your uh, typing speed and tell you, okay, maybe it's time to take a walk. We can follow your, um, your um, social media usage and tell you and ask you, how are you feeling right now? Um, so many examples, but the goal is that we're the antidote that is analyzing your data for your own good. And um, so that's that's uh, that's the short version. Okay, so Amir, Michael, to you. Yeah, thank you. So Michael, let's let's do the technical magic. Um, I'm your backup. If... Okay. Um, I hope that what I'm doing can be seen. You're going to see. Very good. You're going to see that much of what I say is a complement and extension of what you heard from Yair. But I'm the work that I do at MIT is somewhat on the larger strategic measurement side. And I very much understand and appreciate it, both as an advisor and somebody working with a lot of organizations on how to get greater value from their workforce, from their, forgive me, human capital, that the issues of metrics and measurement and assessment are so important. But I want to do a acronymic pun, my apologies, and say that KPIs also stands for key people indicators. And I think it's critical to understand the purpose of measurement and the measurement of purpose. And if there's a single takeaway I want to use to evoke and provoke conversation and debate and design, it's that measurement best practice and the perception of measurement should be as a means to an end. 
There are too many people, too many organizations, too many HR folks, too many CPOs whose view is, what's the number that we need to have? Let's measure, let's make sure, let's create accountability. But the real issue is not what kind of measures and metrics are we using, but what do we want that accountability to mean? What, do, what kind of outcomes do we seek to capture? The wrong questions. You know that saying, you know, there's this classic academic phrase that there's no such thing as a bad question. Um, if you'll forgive me, that's bullshit. There are bad questions. And here are two of them. What KPI should we be using? And what met metrics should we be benchmarking? Perhaps you are guilty of asking these horrible, horrible questions. Lord knows I have been. Why are these bad questions? Because they really are focusing on the wrong things. They're focusing on KPIs as a means as opposed to the end. And you, you heard Yair allude explicitly to this. The end is the means, you know, for our 25 is not just capturing your time, it's giving you insight and agency around how you get value from your time. So my biggest frustration is when I have, and working with really, really smart people in really, really smart organizations, and they're spending too much time focusing on trying to answer the wrong question that they spent too much time trying to define. So this brief talk, and it will be brief, is what should the point and purpose of measurement be? What should the point and purpose of measurement and metrics be? How do I know about the wrong questions and stuff? Because I was guilty of it and have been guilty of it. I was doing funded research at MIT at the Sloan School for a large organization that shall remain nameless. And this was just before the pandemic was kicking in and the hypothesis that we had come up with, which I think everybody on this call will grant is a legitimate hypothesis or seemed at the time to be a legitimate hypothesis is the technology endowment, the digital investment in the knowledge workforce locally and worldwide was increasing. Everybody was becoming a cyborg. Technology transforms us all into networked cyborgs. So what's the leadership challenge? What's the management challenge? How do we get more value from a cyborg workforce? That's what we began researching. And guess what? The more we began talking with leaders and more importantly, listening to them and their direct reports and to workforces and looking at their engagement surveys, et cetera, the more we realized this was wrong. This wasn't capturing stuff. That as interested as people were in performance and productivity, they were also interested in purpose. And then of course the pandemic starts kicking in. Why are we working so hard? Why are we doing all of this stuff? You know, to what end? To what end? Not the means, to what end? What is our purpose? Not just our mission statement, what's our purpose? And I swear to you, this began as a bit of a joke because I was saying, well, gee, maybe how do we measure purpose? And so I did a, another acronymic pun, sorry. I ripped off net promoter scores and changed the P to purpose score. And you say, would you tell others that this organization is well aligned around purpose? Leadership question. And would you tell other people, you know, do you believe it's that? And would you tell other people? So it's your personal view and would you become ripping off from the NPS a vocabulary, an evangelist, a promoter in this regard. Guess what? This joke was taken very, very seriously by the majority of organizations we spoke with because this was the question that leadership increasingly had. Geez, we're coming up with all manner of ways of measuring performance with KPIs and productivity with KPIs in a remote and hybrid workforce, but how are we seeking to assess purpose? What kind of ends are people working on their performance and productivity means for. And this raises the obvious question of your metrics culture, your measurement culture, your key performance, key productivity, key people, key purpose indicator. Are you aware of the kind of metrics culture you have? Is it oriented heavily towards performance or do you incorporate purpose? 
how do you know? How do you measure how you measure? How do you become more self-aware of what you're measuring? And to what extent are you falling into traps of confirmation bias, as opposed to gaining actionable insight into how your individuals, you yourself, your teams, and your colleagues are not just spending your time, but investing your time. Now, as I look at organizations in the future, it's very clear that there's some competition, there's some complementary aspect and some supplementary aspects. We see no shortage of genres of performance analytics. We see the rise of employee experience, all the touch points becoming more and more important. And we have the notion of what is the leadership and cultural sensibility associated with those performance analytics and that employee experience? How are, how is purpose incorporated? How does the organization inform and empower and engage its workforce as individuals and as teams? These are the kinds of issues that you face. And this is the virtuous cycle that I hope we're going to spend a little bit of time discussing today and what you heard Ayer explicitly discuss here. We have performance measure, performance analytics that measure performance. Okay. But how does that relate to the way we want to engage and empower and energize and inform individuals? How does that engagement, empowerment, and energy inform and enhance the employee experience? If we change the employee experience, how does it change the performance analytics? How are we giving people as individuals the ability to focus and become more introspective and measurably aware about the value of their time? Oops, I skipped over this lesson. Who owns this KPI? Who in your organization should own it? Is it the exco? Is it the chief people officer? Is it HR? It's not just how do we do a better job of any one of these things. The real challenge is how do we turn it into a virtuous cycle? Because that's what digital transformation enables. That's what digital transformation means. And that's how you get more people to align better with greater purpose. Those are my hopefully fairly quick remarks. I'm open to any comments, questions, and criticisms you have. And if you want to flame me on a more personal basis, that's my email. I'll stop now. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, I know this. Um, so maybe I would like to start with a panel, but before that, we will I'm yes. stopping sharing. There we go. <clears throat> Thank you. If someone would like to ask a question or start discussing, it will be even, even better. Anyone, something in mind? Okay, so maybe we'll, we'll make it happen with the designated questions for the panel. So um, I'll, I'll ask maybe with, with the first question. We are talking about attention and, and focus and, and making maybe better well-being for, for employees. The question is, so what? If this is a for-profit company, which the majority of the organizations are, and people are, maybe top management are relatively cynical. So how will it help the company? And that's that's a big dilemma because I don't think there is any CEO or VPs that will say, no, it's not good for us to have employees with better well-being. But when it comes to the board, what is he talking about really? So if I can use a little bit, uh, maybe something from, what do you think, you? Yeah. Um, so obviously, we see uh, we see direct to the correlation. Uh, like we're measuring uh, too many tabs open and too much time on Facebook and too many open tasks. But what it it really means uh, is uh, if we affect these uh, symptoms, uh, we can change. Uh, we can improve and, and get uh, to uh, to less sick days or less turn turnover or better employer brand or better employee experience. Because these, um, these symptoms affect how, how we perform and how we feel. And when uh, we have too many tabs open and when we repeatedly enter Gmail 500 times a day, we're not doing um, a deep job. We're not doing a job that is um, in a state of flow. And it makes us to simplify things, unhappy. 
there's a Harvard research um, about the correlation between uh, being in a state of flow and happiness. And once we do a good job, we're happier. And then like it's it's a different uh, or it's a, it's an improved employee experience. I hope that answers the question. Well, Thank I'm, you. I'm going to offer a, a, a quick but but more cynical response to that. I actually think that battle is over. I think that in the wake of the pandemic, managers and leaders pretty much understand that that they the wellness of their employees matters. Now we can take the approach my flawed approach that they're cyborgs and do use things like tab counts as preventive maintenance, just the way you do preventive maintenance for a car or a robot. So you're, you're doing preventive maintenance for cyborgs. The flip side, which I, I also happen to prefer, is that you respect the fact that people are people and that they do care about things like purpose and they do like flow states and they will take advantage of tools and technologies that give them insights and information that facilitate flow states. So I don't think you have to convince the board and the exco anymore. I just think you have to convince them that what you offer can deliver. I think the assumptions that have been raised here are valid assumptions. And I think the question is now, how can we incorporate them organizationally and operationally and cost-effectively? Okay, I, I, it is a bit cynical because I can tell you that, for example, a conversation we recently had, which was dominated by HR people, they were very frustrated because CEOs came to them and told them, show me the people has less sick days, that are taking less vacation or more vacations and, and like hard stuff. They were not so much convinced. Uh, Tara, you wanted to add something? Yeah, hi, no, I think it's a fascinating application. And I think there are uh, uh, like to Yar's point, Yar's, I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. Uh, there are a lot of positive applications that speaks to wellness and productivity. I just came off a conference, which we just, the privacy dominated a lot of the conferences. Right. So my concern is, it's great that you're collecting all of these data points to see where people should maybe put their attention to, but are there privacy concerns about the, the, the granularity of the data and who it's going to be shared with? And do you share it with third parties? Yeah, that's that's definitely a, a big issue and it always comes. I can tell you that when we start trials with companies, we let them choose. We let them choose between getting aggregated information in order to have better decision making and not only help the employees directly, or do not get any information at all just because of the potential concerns of people. That's totally true. The issue is, by the way, it's a little bit I think communicating with what Michael was saying, um, employees are already exposed. Employers today, even legally, can enter emails, phone records, a meeting, practically everything. The privacy in the workplace is exposed. But when you come with something new, especially it's not titled Microsoft or Google, um, people say, oh, well, etc." So yes, we actually propose employers to do that and do not have even aggregated and anonymized, obfuscated information. If I can just add a quick follow-up to that, these are legal questions, and obviously Europe is different than the United States, is different than, you shall excuse the expression, mainland China in regards to privacy and surveillance. That said, I think this is one of the most important issues. Uh, it goes right back to the KPI culture. Maybe you give this as a tool to people and you say, well, we're not gonna look at it. This is for your benefit. We're not going to monitor these things. Yes, we, we are gonna track attendance. We're going to track all the things that we would narrowly do, but this is given as an empowerment tool for you. Will all organizations or the majority of organizations take that path? I have no idea, but I also have no doubt that a few organizations believe in empowerment for empowerment's sake, and we'll see whether that turns out to be a good business. This, this by the way, goes directly to, and I can, I swear you, I swear to you, it's written on my, as the next question. I would like to challenge this, if you can really help me with that. Aaron, can employers be uh, relevant to employees' well-being? Honestly, 
is it a private battle or employers, employers can honestly, keeping in mind their own KPIs or the enterprise KPIs, be part of this journey? <clears throat> because just to connect it, Todd, exactly from the point of view that you mentioned, employ, employees might say, leave me alone. I don't want you to help me with my mobile YouTube and, and, and what I do with the stuff that I'm, I'm answering emails. What do you care about what I do other than that? So I, are employers I relevant? This. I will say this. I would not hire somebody who says, I don't want you to help me. Mm. Okay. Now, some people are happy to do that. But I think we should not, you know, this is back to the means to an end issue. If you're simply treating people as means to an end, that's exploitive. If you're investing in people to give them optionality around becoming better people and striking a better, I picked this word deliberately, healthier balance between time, focus, attention, and work, I think that's different. I think that's a meaningful end. I think that's a purposeful end. I would be comfortable defending that. But different organizations have different cultures. I, we could do a survey of the people on this call and ask how many people work in healthy cultural organizations. That may influence the direction of this conversation. Can, can you I ask that question? Can you, take, can you take the challenge? Maybe Chris, because I saw that you uh, actually, I, I'm going to you for a second. I did ah, prepare okay. a poll before this event, so I'm going to launch the poll right now and see what you say. So I, I wrote this the Beautiful. question before I heard Michael's question uh, presentation. Beautiful. Oh, you thank you. For products you're pretty. Bu you're pretty bloody clever. Go for it. <laughs> so I did we'll it. Announce. I'll announce uh, the the results in a minute. Michael, I had a question for you. Um, yeah. Amazing presentation, by the way. Thank you, and thank you, Ayir and Amir. Um, do you think purpose is scalable, right? So I come, I started my career on Wall Street. I worked for J.P. Morgan for eight years, where uh, the purpose is to make money. Like there's no other purpose that I, I, that I was aware of. And then my next company was a smaller, you know, like B, Series B company that ultimately became a unicorn because we were smaller, a few hundred people. I felt more purpose. And now I work with my best friend in college, so I have maximum purpose. But do you think that like scale purpose is scalable as a company grows, right? Like, you know, if our 25.ai becomes, you know, thousands of people one day, do you think that you can still maintain that purpose or so, tens of thousands of people? Forgive the data compression answer. Um, first off, Jamie Dimon, I'm sure would disagree with you about the purpose of JP Morgan is just to make money, but that's a conversation we can have offline. I, I think the tweak I would put in your question is, as we scale, how should purpose change? Do we begin with purpose as a way, is, is you've all seen magnets and iron filings around magnets. You know, remember in the old days, what was the Google motto in the old days? We organize the world's information. Purpose number one, don't be evil. That's our approach, okay? They've sort of abandoned the latter, double down on the former. But how do you pick purpose that lends itself to scalability and reduces coordination costs and transaction costs? But I think your question is a very interesting one. I think leadership is about making purpose scale and scalable, making purpose an invitation to scale. Um, when, you're a, when you're an entrepreneur in a startup, clearly you have a different, more intimate notion of purpose. When you start passing the two or 300th employee level, your purpose better be more accessible and allow you to attract the next 200 or 500 people, not to mention the next 200 or 500 users. That's interesting. So okay, the poll I'm came in. You guys what's the number? Out? So yeah. what, what would you think? Half the people answered which one? Well, if it's half, it's going to be. <laughs> no, well, there were four choices. If there were four so choices. One know. option was. Just, uh, just before, before you guess, remember, it's not a form of CFOs here. <laughs> so half the it's people said, guess. like, and the right answer to everything, it depends. Depends on the day, which I, 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 which is what I would choose. And I think 
you know, you can't optimize like always purpose or always productivity, right? Like right. The productivity is the micro and the purpose, the macro. Um, then 36% of the people set purpose and then 14% set productivity. So to me, I think it's, there's no surprises. I, I would love to hear from the audience. Like, so, so you know, what, what, do you, what pick, why but, did you pick it? But let me ask you a question at this one, at, at this one, Jen. Which ones, which companies would you rather invest in? The productivity ones or the purpose ones? I think everyone would say purpose, right? Really? I take productivity, my background is economics. I take, you know, I love purpose, but I'm going to look at the productivity numbers, okay? You know, you know, this is the thing. I want to see alignment between productivity and purpose. I want to see, with all due respect to, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I want to see alignment between personal focus and productivity. I well, don't stop, stop, stop for a second. Alignment is in correlation or causality. Can you sign on causality? You as a scholar, it's so a serious question. It's 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 not my fault. You guys didn't get Judea Pearl on your advisory board. Correlation isn't enough. We need to look for causal inference. That exactly. said. I think one can make meaningful assertions of causality between the ability to focus and the ability to be productive. So, so I, I, you know, I think we don't have have perfect identification of causal mechanisms, but I think we're beyond high, you know, high, you know, 0.7 or 0.8 R, you know, small R on this. I think there are mechanisms there. Introspection, it is more, there is value to reflection and introspection. Sorry for going on on this. I want to give a chance, Alkana or Janice, would you like to expound um, what your comment in the chat? Alkana said purpose is scalable. I would love to, you know, if you're still free to- getting off, free. I'm getting off um, mute because Michael, dude, I'm yeah. sending you email because you are screaming my life right now. Um, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Because so just quick background, I built technology that eliminates meetings. And we have closed a private beta where we rolled out our software to 153 organizations, including Amazon, Adidas, Comcast, Twitter, where our strategic planning platform that provides one-click business insights is increasing productivity by 70% and decreasing meetings by 25% week over week. I literally today had a meeting with large company, highly matrixed, and a lot of what you're saying, Michael, they're trying to figure out. So I'm like, oh my goodness, did you have like a, a, a listening device <laughs> in my meeting earlier today? <laughs> I think it's fair to say that the issues we're discussing here, these are transcendent issues. And if I was fluent in Spanish or German or Mandarin, or, or uh, uh, Portuguese, I, I think we'd be hearing elements and aspects of all the things we're discussing now in English. And including, you know, your, the situation that you're describing with kudos to you, you know, this, this productivity thing, which rebalances meetings and productivity and interaction, presumably in a provocative way. I just want to highlight what Janice wrote. She had to hop um, so she can't share, but she said, uh, when you said, what would you invest in? She said, depends on the goal as an investor. If productivity is producing outcomes of no value, then I wouldn't want to invest in it. Um, and I think the poll was a bit of a trick question, right? It forced you to, to choose between productivity and purpose, even though we would all want both, right? Um, but I think like to Yair and what Amir is working on of, you know, when you're browsing through social media, you, you meant to spend one minute, but you spend 30 minutes, you don't feel purpose or productivity, right? So it's like removing time spent that feels wasted because you were neither and you want to optimize time that is both productive and purposeful. Exactly right. If I can just do a copy edit in the chat, it's by George Gilder, not George Miller, Life After Google. Gilder was an interesting guy. It is an interesting guy, He's still alive. So. You're actually totally right. It's George Gilder. That's a typo on my standpoint. But like since Michael brought it up, the reason why I'm saying that, because there is not a contradiction between purpose and skill. What 
George Gilder is starting to talk about in that book is that Google is clear in its purpose, whether we know it or not. And that has scaled to massive levels. Right. And blockchain is upending that. And they talk, he talks about it as a worldview, as a psychology. And he compares Google and Apple. So like, I just encourage everybody to read it. And we probably could have a whole discussion about that. It, 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 let's, get him, let's get him to talk. He's a, he's, a, he's a good guy. He, like, like me, he falls on the old white male uh, uh, um, category. But, you know, you can't have everything. Just to, just to say something about what you said, Jean, um, we believe the key is in emotional state. And this might create the triangle we are looking for. So if we have purpose and productivity, you cannot be in a state where your emotional state is stable relatively if you don't have a, pers a purpose. You need something else to push you. Uh, for example, if, you're, if you work for a gaming industry, and I'm not talking about quick, um, uh, cute games. And you know what I mean. It's very hard to find purpose uh, if you talk about it in your, uh, I don't know, in your dinner with the family. It doesn't look good. But if you play with your emotional state, you might be able to do it for a short while. And this also goes to investment, I think. So it's a major challenge. And if we focus, that's, that's our choice. We focus on the emotional state of the person what he really wants. And if it goes out of purpose, yes, he should live or he shouldn't play the game. But if it aligns because the purpose game is really pushing hard and it's improving, this should also go to, go to productivity, we believe. If I may, if I may jump in with a question here. Oh, no, I was what? waiting for you. You made all kinds of with your hands. <laughs> no, I, I kept having other things I wanted to say and now I'm thinking <laughs> what I want to say now because there's so much going on. But actually, what I wanted to come back to is that, I, Michael, I'm wondering if the sole focus on, on purpose or on any aspect of this is actually destroying us from understanding the whole better. Because I think that purpose without someone being self-directed or interested in development doesn't mean anything. So unless we can just include that in the definition of purpose, it's something with purpose is self-directed no. and initiating that. Let's be let's be clear here. First, this is going to be, let me be a weasel, and then let me answer your question more comprehensively. The weasel thing is, I'm speaking for five minutes, okay? So, you know, <clears throat> so putting, putting that aside, the original sin of OR, operations research, or what the Brits call operational, uh, operations or operational research, or what the Brits call it, is we have an objective function we seek to maximize. You're exactly right. I am not interested in how, and I don't believe it's the right thing to do to objectively optimize, uh, to optimize an objective function. I think the challenge is, forgive me, what kind of portfolio of metrics should we be managing in a more holistic, comprehensive way? How do we strike a balance between growth, revenue, customer lifetime value, employee experience, et cetera? This is what definition and leadership is about. So, so ultimately, I believe that innovations that, that we're describing here, you know, you, you want to give people the tools to see and experience, how am I making these kinds of trade-offs? This algorithm, what recommendations, what is the choice architecture of recommendations as to why I should invest my time doing this versus that. I think that's the direction that we're ultimately going. So absolutely, I chose to emphasize purpose here as both a differentiator and because I'm trying to optimize within 300 second constraints. Fair enough. Um, so I believe then that there's a, there's a whole, there's a, there's a basket full. <laughs> Of, of metrics along these lines. And I just wonder why people don't implement them earlier in the hiring process. Um, I'll say that I was at a larger company and I rolled out the global enterprise social network back in the day, some 10 years ago. And the CLO for the organization um, literally wouldn't let us use emojis with sunglasses as a sort of attaboy thumbs up shame, because shame, they're afraid of the hiring process. Shame on him. Yeah. Them. Well, we got by it and they realized it, but what it came down to was realizing that we had hiring process in place, 
that should lead us to trusting our employees. But there's a fear of risk that doesn't allow certain people to do that. Would you forgive me for saying that's a reflection of cultural values? Yeah. Do you, do you want to hire employees you can trust? I, I'm not going to pick on JP Morgan. I'm not going to pick on, on, on Jing's old employer, but you know, there, there are a lot of really, really smart investment bankers who you'd be an idiot to do a shake hands deal with, you know? So, so do, you, do you mean the ones that invest in Elon Musk's initiatives? I, 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 I am just so, not, I am just so not going to go there. It's not. <laughs> yes. But I think, you, the, 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 I think the point is a clear one, though. But these are the issues that over time are going to become more important. And that's why I think it's wise that we have these kinds of conversations. If, if I may get one more question, and we've, I've worked with a group we call Waymakers, we've been, you know, whatever, getting together for a while. And one of the things we've really landed on is that the X factor, the catalyst in creating exponential growth companies with strong cultures and everything else came down to a sense of co-ownership. Uh, not just not just like the paper co-ownership, although tangible is really important because it's just the word, you know, handshake, not so great. But what role does that play as you start looking at it? And have you found any metrics that might, or survey questions that might reflect getting at that sense of co-ownership? Two quick responses. There's a wonderful book we've talked about George Gilder a moment ago. There's a wonderful book by Jillian Tett, T-E-T-T, -T, who writes for the FT called The Silo Effect. And too often leadership is about how do we orchestrate assorted silos. I do a lot of research, I think very good research in KPIs and mashing up machine learning and KPIs. And one of the most important ways to transform a KPI is to make it a shared KPI. The not so rhetorical question I ask Fortune 1000 organization leaderships is customer lifetime value. Who should own that? Marketing, the chief commercial officer, the CFO, and almost always there's a fight, but you realize that ultimately you need shared ownership of customer or client lifetime value. You know, no matter what Jamie Dimon says, you know, Right, Jing? So. Thank you so much, Michael. This has been Thank such you. a brilliant chat. Thank you, everyone, for being here.